Are we live? They're still on hold. So, are we right, Andrew? Hello, Andrew. Are you there, Andrew? We seem to be having technical glitches. Andrew? We have a technical glitch. And I can't hear you. And the attendees are still on hold. Andrew, come in. Are you there, Andrew? Hello, everyone. I just had a little bit of technical difficulty there. Sorry. Can everyone hear me now? <laughs> I can hear you. But I've got attendees are still on hold on my screen. Attendees are still on hold. Okay. Start, start, start broadcasting. Well, uh, let's see. I would have thought that people could see my screen. Uh, so, let's ask the question, can people hear us? If you can hear us, please raise your hand. Sure. Yay, we've got at least one that can hear. <laughs> but can everyone else hear us? You'd think if one can hear, then surely the others can too. Well, you would like to Ask, hope so. Uh, yep. So, can't, can't, who else apart from David Hamilton can hear us? Just raise your hand. On your screen you'll see a little hand sign. So just click on that um, to show that you can hear us. No one apart from David. Okay. So, so let's so, see. Let's start. Okay. Thanks for coming, everyone. Can everyone hear us? Uh, we're just checking because we seem to be having a few diff technical difficulties. If you can, there's a little hand here. If you can press that um, to show that you can actually hear us speaking. We're going to a few more, everyone. That looks pretty good. I think we're on the yeah. go, Andrew. Good stuff. Okay. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you do have any problems, raise your hands. If you want to ask a question, there is a um, box down here where it says type your questions here anytime. They will only come to myself or Andrew. If we can answer them on the spot, we will. If not, we will save them over to a question time. We do have um, two or three question times throughout this presentation. So if you don't get a response from us, when you actually ask a question, we will raise it at one of those spots. Um, and just to get the ball rolling, um, for those that do grow plants in particular, um, what um, 
viruses have you actually seen in your nursery that you can actually recognise? Uh, if you just want to type that in the question, that way it gives us an idea that you can um, understand what we've been saying. So if you rec recognise viruses, um, just let us know which ones you've seen most often in your plants. Um, that'd be a great start. Um, so how are we going for attendees? We seem to be getting most people coming in. We're getting quite a few now. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of polyviruses okay. and cu cucumber green mottle mosaic virus. That's from Lucy. Okay. Um, tomorrow spotted wilts. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting quite a, oh wow. A lot of orchid viruses, variegated virus and citrus. Oh. So if you're seeing all these, why are you here? You, no. you probably know more just as much as we do. <laughs> okay, so we may as well get started. It's after 10 o'clock. I'll hand over to Andrew and like I say, if you have any questions, send them through. We'll try and answer them on the spot or we'll collate them for a later time during the actual presentation. Um, our first poll, just so we can get things rolling, uh, I will just launch it. Um, we just want to know how many people are viewing the webinar on your computer, including yourself. So just tick a box so we just get some idea of how many are actually there um, watching this presentation at the same time. So tick a box if you can, that'd be great. Uh, it's, I don't know if it's launched. Um, oh, here we go. Oh, I've been launched. Sorry, there we go. Sorry, that's my fault. Technical issues. Yeah, just pick one of the boxes, whether it's just yourself or you've got two, three, four or more people um, at your computer. Uh, did that? Did that work? I wonder if we. Yeah, I'm not sure if it did. I think I think we response. both hit the button, John. We're going to keep on rolling, I think. Yeah, technical problems <laughs> always happen. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll hand it over to Andrew, and you'll won't hear from me until question time. Off to you, over to you, Andrew. Okay, thanks, John. So I'm Andrew Manners. Um, first of all, I'm going to give you an overview of the project in which this webinar sort of sits. It's just one aspect of a larger project. Then we're going to get into um, the guts of the project, how to identify virus symptoms and how people actually identify viruses and diagnostic labs and then and how we manage those viruses in, in the nursery. So we'll get started. The project has a strong biosecurity aspect to it. We're writing lots of fact sheets and test management plans. We're doing workshops. We have a diagnostic component where production nurseries can send us samples and either have a free samples if they're NIAS accredited or um, at a much discounted rate. So biosecurity in the sense of being pest and disease management as opposed to sort of the, the more regulatory side of biosecurity. So there are a lot of a lot of different things going on in the news in, in the project and if you keep an eye on the NGIA newsletter and the website then you can keep track of what's going on. Okay. So what is a virus and how a virus is spread? So you all probably know that viruses are very small. They're microscopic. The non-cellular particles, there are arguments over whether or not they are really alive and most people think that they're not really alive. But they do have specific structures within them. So they're not just random bits of DNA or RNA. They have very specific morphology and, and structures associated with each species of, of virus. They're generally less than a thousand nanometers. So one, sorry, a thousand nanometers is one micrometer and there are a thousand micrometers in one millimeter. So we're talking really small. 
as I said, they can be RNA or DNA, single or double stranded, and, and you don't really need to, from a from a practical sense in a nursery, you don't really need to know that information. It's just that it gives you the idea that they're not all just the same thing. They, one virus will behave differently, and part of that is just how they're made up. So virus species names are different from any other species name in animals, plants, or anything else that's got a, a taxonomic name. They have an English species name, so and it, and it sounds more like a common name than it does an actual species name. So cucumber green model mosaic virus, so sometimes they're a bit of a mouthful. The cucumber relates to the first plant species that it was recognized from, that it was isolated or characterized from, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't go on other plant species. And as you may well know, cucumber green model goes to a number of different cucurbit crops. And it's often will then be um, abbreviated CGNMV. So all, all viruses have that abbreviation and you do need to be aware that there is crossover between the plant virus world and the animal virus world. So some viruses will have the same abbreviation but actually refer to two different, completely different viruses. So keep that in mind and be careful. So there are a thousand known viruses currently characterized. The vast majority of these are from cultivated plants. It makes sense, the broadacre, vegetables, grain, fruit crops, they've been cultivated for, in, often, in many time, cases a long time. People have done a lot of research on them and so they become aware that the viruses are present. In all likelihood, most plant species have a suite of viruses, or at least one, that may sometimes infect it. But particularly for those little, little known or the species of plants that haven't been studied well, it's unlikely that those viruses have been identified yet. And as a matter of interest, it is, there are a number of theories of where viruses came from. The, the theory that I like the best is that they may have originated from normal cellular constituents and then become self-replicating and parasitic. But other, other theories in, include things like that they originated from sort of non-cellular things prior and then, look, it's complicated and I don't know the full story. I'll just leave it there, thanks. Virus particles come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And these are just some of those shapes and, and that we can see under the electron microscope. So they are tiny, you can't just look at it underneath a normal microscope, I'm sure most people would realize that. And unless you get a picture sent to you from a diagnostic lab, and there aren't many of these labs, many of the labs that have an electron microscope um, in, in Australia, to be honest. So how do viruses spread? Almost all viruses are transmitted through vegetative propagation and grafting. So if you start taking plant material from a mother stock plant that has been infected with a virus, even if it doesn't show symptoms, you're like, you will have the virus in those cuttings. So it's important to make sure that your mother stock plants are free of virus. A lot of, there are other methods by which viruses are transmitted. Not all viruses are transmitted by all of these methods and the rate at which they're transmitted at, with these different mechanisms can be different for different species. But some viruses are spread by seed, by pollen, mechanical contact. Um, and noted we've got an orchid grower, so an orchid grower knows that you have to be extraordinarily diligent in making, in, in having very high standard, 
hygiene protocols in place so that you don't spread viruses through the nursery. We'll talk in more detail about tobacco mosaic virus a little bit later, which is quite have, uh, that, that species has a very wide host range and can be spread from dried plant material, tobacco, and then infect the crop. Okay, so next, the next main method by which vectors, uh, by which viruses can be spread is through vectors, of course. So many different organisms, insects and mites mainly, can vector viruses. The biggest, the most common group are aphids, but then there are also white flies and mealybugs, and you can see the list here. There are a small number of nematodes that vector viruses, and even a small number of fungi that have a motile stage. So similar to Phytophthora, they have sporangia that move between plants along in you know, a water, and that can potentially vector viruses in, in certain species. The important thing you need to know is that if a virus is vectored by aphids, it may be a number of different aphid species that vector the virus, but it won't be vectored by white flies or mealybugs or anything else. It'll only be vectored by aphid, certain aphid species. In the same way, if it's vectored by white flies, it won't be vectored by any other group of insects or mites. The virus vector relationship is very specific. So the virus attaches to the insect and moves through the insect in a very specific way, and it just doesn't work in more than one group of vectors. And there are three key aspects to that virus vector relationship. There's the acquisition period, the time required to take up that virus. So it's the insect will, let's say, feed on the infected plant. So it's the length of time it needs to feed to take the virus into the body of that insect or mite or vector. Then there's the period of time that is required for the virus to become infective in the vector. And there's also a period of time that the virus remains in the vector. So those three aspects are important for, for management and we'll explain why here in a moment. So some viruses are, are characterized as fast and Virologists have technical terms for these concepts, but I've sort of summarized it as fast because it's, it's practical. They're acquired quickly, so it may only be in the slightest tiny amount of feeding on a virus-infected plant. It takes up that virus into the, into the vector. It may, the fast viruses, have no latent period. They're basically transmitted immediately. So as soon as it moves to another plant it, and puts its mouth parts in, even the smallest amount, it can infect that plant. But by the same token, they're only retained for a short period of time. In general, minutes or hours, or at, in some cases, until that insect molts to the next stage. So you can imagine from a fast virus transmission perspective, Spraying for a virus isn't all that effective. And in fact, it can increase the incidence of the virus in the crop. And the way that happens is the insect, let's say, already has the virus in it, and it puts its mouth parts in a tiny little amount, it doesn't basically feed at all, but transmits that virus into the plant and goes, ooh, I don't like the taste of this, it's got pesticide on it takes off, goes to another plant, and can do the same thing over and over again. So it can spread the virus more quickly than it otherwise would if it didn't have an insecticide present on the crop. Okay, then 
there are viruses that are slow. They're acquired only after hours or days of feeding on the infected plant and they require days or weeks to move through the host, through the virus, through the vector, sorry, I get all these V words. So, so it can take days or weeks to, for the virus to move through, let's say the aphid in this case, and you can see how the path can go through. So in some cases, it has to go through a long process, going through the digestive system, and there are different barriers that can stop viruses moving through the insect, and then it can have to, sometimes we may have to go through the blood, in inverted commas, it's hemocyl, and into the salivary gland. So if there are some complex mechanisms by which the, the virus particles move through that insect and in some cases it takes a long time. But for these slow transmitted viruses, they're generally re retained, the virus is retained in the vector for the rest of its life. And then there are some viruses that are more like in the middle. So in the, all those three aspects are more in the middle, acquired after hours or days of feeding and require maybe only a relatively short period of time, hours or days, to transmit that virus and then retain for days or weeks. And sometimes days or weeks can be the lifespan of the insect, but um, in general, the slower the transmission rate, the more likely pesticides can be effective at reducing the spread, the incidence in the crop. So it can be quite valuable in that sort of a framework to know what species of virus you're dealing with. It's not just, oh, it's got virus. If you know what species it is you, and you can find out some of the biology of that virus, it can help with the management. You can know what are the other host plants. So if, if you're dealing with virus, it is definitely worthwhile having identified two species two species to find that extra information. Okay, so this is our first question point. And we do have an interesting one for you, Andrew. Um, this will test your knowledge out. Um, uh -huh. what, about the, what about the accidental transmission by mm -hmm. these insect vectors, um, by mechanical transmission and not by mm -hmm. their normal vector transmission um, in, its true, as its, in its true sense? I guess, can they mechanically transmit the virus at the same time as being a true vector? Yeah, I think that's where particularly certain beetle species come in where they have a chew on the plant and then move to another plant and have a chew on that plant. And incidentally, then cause the virus particles to go into the healthy plant. So yes, absolutely. So some some insects where they actually are dam physically damaging the plant, um, and yep. that is a mechanically transmitted virus, yep. and move move it from plant to plant that way. Um, Effectively, it's, one, it's like. Sorry. No, go on. Effectively, it's it's mechanical transmission is where you have rubbing. If, if your leaves are rubbing together and it's a mechanically transmitted virus, then you can have that virus spread. So it's, it's not too different. Or if you have secateurs, you, you cut your plant. It's not much different from... If, you, if you've got a virus that can be tra uh, vectored via secateurs, then it seems quite possible for a a chewing insect from moving from one plant to another to spread the virus as well. Yep. And <clears throat> another question is, with regard to spotted wool, is it fast, medium or slow? That's a good question. I actually can't answer that. I would have to Google it, to be honest, or ask a virologist. Sorry, yeah, Dan. From what I, from what I understand, um, because it's mostly thrips transmitted, it has to mm -hmm. be um, replicated inside the insect <clears throat> and 
uh, taken up by the juveniles um, and mm. it's only transmitted by the adults so that would be a slow one um, it needs to or medium thrips, the thrips have to go through a as part of their life cycle so once they emerge as adults then it's only the adult that can actually transmit it and I think they can transmit it for the rest of their life from if I remember yeah, correctly. Right. Okay. Uh, and the last one from same Dan. Um, we say mostly thrips. Are there other insects that have the possibility to spread? I guess they refer to tomato spotted wilt virus. Yes. So, yeah, so tomato spotted sure. wilt virus only spread by certain species of thrips. But it can still be spread via cuttings and some of the other methods of virus spread. I don't know specifically if it's seed transmitted. We'd have to check up that particular species. But only thrips of vector organisms, only thrips spread tomato spotted wilt. Okay. That's it so far. Thank you, John. Okay, so we're going to get into some of the different symptoms and also virus lookalikes. So symptoms that look like viruses but aren't actually viruses. But before we do, let's. John, would you like? To, I'll, I'll let you this time. Can you please share the next? Oh, it's, it's please um, launch the next poll. There we are. Right. How so, confident do you feel identifying plants that are infected with virus? Um, so just select one or more, I guess, if you think you need to. But um, yeah, just select one and we'll see how we go. <coughs> everyone is voting. Excellent. Okay. Once everyone's voted, we'll, we'll share the results with everyone. Okay, we're up at 90%. All right, 94%. Let's let's leave it at that. It's John, maybe close that out. Okay, close that, and okay. we'll share the results. There we are. Oh, oh that's a pretty a good spread. That don't have Excellent. A flu. Yeah. And no, it's only, it's only about a third. Them. That's pretty good. Yeah. All right. Okay. It's all right. All right. Ah, oh, I got dropped out. One moment. There we go. There we are. Okay, so virus in plants that are infected with a virus are always infected with that virus. They can't be cured. Forevermore, it will be infected. Even if there are no symptoms present, which can sometimes happen, it'll still have the virus present. In most cases, the symptoms start to appear, like when a plant is first infected, the symptoms will start to appear in the new growth as the leaves are expanding. And they rarely start to occur only in the older growth. And this can give you clues as to what you're dealing with. So if you are seeing virus-like symptoms only in the old growth, but not in the new growth, chances are that you're not dealing with a virus. Also, plants rarely grow out of the, out of the symptoms. There are some exceptions. We're dealing with biological systems and the biological systems tend to have exceptions to the rule uh, in, in most cases, but most of the time plants don't grow out of the symptoms. They, they will keep being symptomatic. And you also have to keep in mind that some plants can be asymptomatic carriers of the virus, never showing any symptoms, but still have those particles present and allow vectors to, or other, or yourself taking cuttings and or if it's mechanically transmitted, touching an infected plant and then touching a healthy plant can potentially spread it. So it is worthwhile, if you if you know you're dealing with a virus in your nursery, it's worthwhile knowing what hosts 
uh, what if there are any other hosts of the virus. Okay, so the, the typical Um, sorry, I'm just seeing a message pop up on, no, I think I'm all good, sorry, oops, I'm going to go backwards. So in, in most cases, you, the most, some of the common virus symptoms are mosaic and mottle. And oftentimes they are, they're almost interchangeable, there's arguments about what's mottle and what's mosaic. So your, your model, these are some examples of model, sorry, mosaic before, and this is model. And the difference between them is fairly slight, where mosaic technically has a more distinct edge, whereas model, mosaic has a more distinct edge, model has more diffuse. But sometimes you'll get virologists looking at a symptom and go, oh, that's mosaic. No, 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 that's model. And people being people, it can become heated. So just, and, and sometimes you have the same virus producing both mottle and mosaic symptoms. One of the classic virus symptoms are the ring spots and line patterns. And if you see these sort of symptoms, you can have a high level of confidence that you are dealing um, with a virus in most cases, but keep in mind that there are always exceptions to the rule and sometimes other factors can cause symptoms which are superficially similar. So we also will get vein clearing, vein yellowing, a big vein, sometimes you'll get chlorosis or reddening, the symptoms in this lettuce particularly can be mistaken for a, a, a range of different other factors and, and reddening of a plant can be caused by various factors as well. Necrosis can occur from some viruses and if you, a patient's necrotic spot is an exotic virus that was eradicated some years back from New South Wales. But it's cold in patients' necrotic spot, and in the begonias, yes, it's causing some necrosis. In the spasphilum, well, there is a little bit of necrosis, but mostly it's chlorosis and even perhaps some ring spots there. So just because you see the name, don't let the name rule your judgment or override your thinking about what the virus symptoms are going to look like. So citrus tristeza is another type of sort of decline symptoms and there are a few, a few viruses that in specific systems that can cause basically death of trees. Stunting can occur in some viruses, so it's about to pop up, thank you. The, in bananas, you, banana, um, banana bunchy top, you get the, that bunching effect. Rose spring dwarf is maybe in Australia, but it's never been confirmed. And it's one of those viruses where it, it's the name says it, it's rose spring dwarf. So you'll get that in spring, the, a bunching of the new growth, and then they actually do grow out of those symptoms. So it's a bit odd. But other viruses can cause stunting or, or, or defamation, as we can see here with the leaf rolling when it pops up on the screen, with a little bit of a delay, sorry. So that you can get leaf rolls and leaf curls, and of course with well, it's tomato yellow leaf curls, so the leaves are going chlorotic as well. So there are a lot of different symptoms, and we're sure that we haven't covered all of the types of symptoms from every type of virus, although there are quite a few there. One of the important things you need to realize is that different viruses in the same crop can cause very similar symptoms. So all of these pictures, the symptoms are quite similar, they're caused by different viruses. By, 
similarly, you can have the same virus cause completely different symptoms in different plants and sometimes even in the same plant. So all of the images on the screen here are caused by tomato spotted wilt virus and you can see the range of the symptoms. Sometimes you'll see them in the same plant producing a variety of symptoms as well. So it can be complex. Particularly when you start putting in virus-like symptoms, it's tricky. And there's a reason why a diagnostic lab will receive a reasonable number of samples fairly regularly with suspect viruses where no virus can be detected. It's, uh, and we'll talk about the process of how you deal with those sorts of situations on your, in your nursery soon. So all of these types of factors can cause sometimes at least, symptoms that appear superficially to those caused by viruses. So in this picture here, the chrysanthemum, you can see there's yellowing of the leaves, but you'll note that the new growth is healthy, or, or mostly relatively healthy compared to the older growth. And that's the sort of thing that would give you the clue, okay, I'm probably not dealing with a virus, um, and certainly if you then gave it some fertilizer and it all came good, you'd go, yeah, okay, not seeing any more symptoms. Most, in all likelihood, we weren't dealing with a virus. But it's not always straightforward. Sometimes with some of the, the those minor but important, the trace element nutrient deficiencies, you can get some interesting types of symptoms on certain plants that can potentially be you know, just, um, confused with virus-like symptoms. So it is worthwhile being familiar with your plants and even getting, when you start to see these symptoms, keep a record of websites and or even print out literature on each but for certain plants and so you can go to it and refer, oh, this is the nutrient deficiency, the known nutrient deficiency symptoms for X plant. It, sometimes there are pictures for some of the more commonly grown uh, ornamental plant species, particularly overseas where there have been studies to, sh to show what the symptoms are of nitrogen and iron and magnesium and manganese, all these different types of of mineral deficiencies and toxicities. So it can be a, a useful resource to refer to. So another very common um, scenario is where we have curling of leaves or insect or mite damage that looks superficially to virus symptoms. So we can see there's leaf curling, deformation of the new growth. And if you look at it and you've never seen that symptom on that plant before, you can go on into the literature and go, oh, look, there's a raspberry leaf curl virus. It's not found in Australia. What if I've got that? But the first thing to do is look in the growing tip where you've got that new the new growth is deformed and in this particular case there were loads of broad mites so if you eliminate your broad mites and you see the symptoms go away that's strong evidence that you weren't dealing with a virus you were dealing with a mite or infestation and, and similar concepts can be present for thrips and sometimes even aphids where there's a curling of the leaves and if you don't look carefully, it can be easy to mistake this um, insect or mite damage for virus symptoms. So particularly when the insects are small or not apparent. So it's easy to look over 
the cause of the damage, let's say with spider mites or, or area fired mites, then it can be easy to mistake in these things. And even leaf hoppers sometimes can produce that virus like symptom. Herbicides are another common, commonly mistaken um, cause of virus like symptoms. And it's one which strikes a little bit closer to home to most growers because if herbicide has gone on the crop, somewhere along the line, something's gone wrong. And, and we're all human. People don't like to make mistakes. And sometimes people don't like to have mistakes pointed out to them. And in some cases, there have been plenty of times where malicious acts have occurred. I'm not saying that you should go and accuse people, but it has happened in the past where herbicide's been put in a tank by someone who is meant to cause harm. In most cases, that's not going to be an issue, I would hope. But the, the herbicide damage can look very similar to virus symptoms, and sometimes they can never grow out of those symptoms. And then you're, you're sort of left to look at the pattern at the pattern of the, the distribution of those symptoms. In most cases, virus symptoms are not going to be in blocks. In most cases, then they're going to be, they can be scattered through the crop or, I mean, where the, there are always exceptions to the rule here, but if you're seeing 100% of your crop having the same twisted growth, chances are you're not dealing with a virus and it's some other factor. Whereas if you're seeing scattered symptoms, it's more suspicious for a, a virus being present. So other types of products besides herbicides can also cause virus-like symptoms and, and these can be as a result of a phytotoxic reaction, whether it's an insecticide with the imidacloprid, which is basically similar to a chimera type symptom, which we'll come to later, or a fungicide. If you apply too much product, or too concentrated a product to your crop plant, then you can get interesting symptoms. So in this case, John tells me that he. Uh, miscalculated his application, put a neonicotinoid on at 10 times the rate, and voila, phytotoxic effect. But it's a great example where the old growth has that damage, but then when you look to see the new growth, it's totally healthy. And when you start looking back, when did the symptoms occur? It occurred, oh look, it occurred right after I sprayed that. Oh. Now that I look at that record, it, that looks like far too much. Oh, the label says I'm supposed to do this much. And then the new growth comes out. You have to tease apart these situations and, and look at things quite carefully to work out what has gone wrong. Sometimes it's obvious, like in this case, and other times it can be quite difficult. So Chimera often which is coming up on the screen, be quite distinctive where there's a distinct line, but not always. Sometimes it can be more diffuse and cause some deformities in, in, in the growth and can therefore sometimes be confused with virus. And phytoplasmas, which are popping up, sometimes it can be really obvious but other times not. And this last summer season in South East Queensland, particularly and around Queensland and in New South Wales, there have been, there's been a very, um, very common incidence of phytoplasma in, of, of, in tomatoes and various other crops. Has anyone noticed phytoplasma in the nursery? If you have, maybe just raise your hand. Okay. So sometimes phytoplasma can produce absolutely amazing symptoms, you know, very distinct. And other times, 
not so distinct. I mean, it is still distinct, but not necessarily what you would say as typical. So uh, one one person's seen the phytoplasma, that's great. Oh, no, maybe not. Hand raised. Okay, I'll just close you. There. Okay. Going to move on to sometimes we'll get plants in and you do testing. So this pansy was sent in. We look at it. Uh, an experienced virologist looked at it and went, no, the symptoms do not look viral. We looked at the necrosis. The roots were healthy. There was no evidence of any pathogen present. And in the process, the time taken to, to do the tests, we contacted the grower again and said, oh, the plants have grown out of the symptoms. It, it seems like it's all good now. And in some cases, you never find out what those, the cause of those the symptoms have been. And other times, you can tease it apart, whether it be a, a change, a changes in temperature or some other aspect of growing condition, particularly interactions between pH and EC and nutrient regimes. They can be on the more complicated side to distinguish and to recognize because it's an interacting effect. The nutrient level in the growing media is perfect, but unfortunately something else has happened. The pH has gone too low, and so therefore maybe the certain nutrients which have been locked up and not available to the plant, and then you start getting those symptoms. I'm not a plant nutritionist, but I know those things are possible and complicated to sometimes disentangle. In this case with the Pak Choi, they're concerned of virus. We've, we've looked in under the EM. Symptoms don't, aren't really uh, particularly good for virus symptoms. No virus particles were found. So it's one of those cases where you're left, okay, we'll test everything and, and we'll go through some of that process soon. This example is another one that's, that's good of, there's been an event, you can see the foliage down here has that almost sort of chimera-like symptoms, and then whatever factor was causing those symptoms and those lower leaves peters out. So there's a little bit of symptoms here and a tiny amount of symptoms here, and there were other plant plant material that was sent in that basically the new growth was totally clean. So there's been some sort of an event in the past and it's slowly stopped influencing the plant. And those that sort of a pattern would be a strong indicator that you're not likely to be dealing with a virus. Sometimes so this is a, a parsley. We get plants in, and it's not clear what, what is going on. We can run certain tests, look for fungal or bacterial pathogens present, and you just have to run the gamut of questions that we'll come to in a moment. So we'll go through how, we'll de how one deals with those type of problems in a moment. Are there any questions at this point? Um, this one, Andrew. Um, a lot of the mm -hmm. images you've you've got um, the source of those images as bugwood. Is that a good site for um, finding various virus images of a whole range of different plants? Possibly. Um, it's worth looking at. What you have to keep in mind is who are the people that are diagnosing those images. If if it's a person and you can Google that person and they're a virologist and it's from a let's say university of blah 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 in the US or some other university you go okay there's a strong likelihood that they verify that in the lab so that, so that those symptoms are likely to be real. Whereas if it's just a, a, a 
a citizen, so to speak, you know, just someone who doesn't have a position associated with them and when you Google them, they're not associated with any literature, scientific literature, then you might go, hmm, well, maybe that is exactly what it is, but maybe it's not. It's like anything on the internet. You take it with a grain of salt, depending on how it's written, the source. Do you have anything to add to that, John? Yep. No. no. And thanks for the plug about um, putting too much chemical on my plants, too. I really appreciate that. No worries, John. <laughs> always, always happy to help. <laughs> um, hang on. We did have one come through. Um, does rolling the bug transmit virus? as following the epidemic, of, um, yeah, I guess we saw that phytoplasma okay. um, mm -hmm. in various crops in the valley here recently. Yep. Okay, so rather glen bug doesn't transmit phytoplasma. I'm not aware if it trans transmits or vectors any viruses, but they certainly do not vector phytoplasma. It's only, um, only leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, I believe, that transmit or vector phytoplasma. Uh, I think it was just sheer coincidence that we had yeah. very large numbers of Rutherglen bugs this season um, and then we did see a lot of um, phytoplasma damage in a whole range of crops. So it was just very coincidental. Yep. All right. Well, we'll have another question I'll time at the end, so if you have more. If you get more, just keep plowing them through, guys, um, and we'll pile them up uh, for the end. Okay. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Okay, so how do we identify viruses? First of all, from a practical perspective, these are the sorts of things that I'd recommend as a grower that you do. So first of all, the easiest thing to do is check the new growth for insects and mites. And sometimes that's actually not all that easy. So these aerified mites, they're in the growing tip of a tomato. With a hand lens, you're not going to see these mites because there's a mite there that's probably 100 to maybe maybe 200 micrometers. So that's like a tenth to a twentieth of a millimeter. And there's you know smaller, thinner than they are long. And unless you have a times 20 hand lens and are good at detecting these things, you really need a microscope with, let's say, times 40 magnification monocular view to, to be able to visualize those very small aerified and broad mites with confidence. So if you look at the plants and you go, okay, there are no insects present, there are no thrips, there are no aphids, there are no other types of, of insects in there that are causing curling or deformity, then Perhaps look at the literature, find out what are the symptoms of viruses that are known to occur in that crop. What are the symptoms of the deficiencies that are known to occur in that species, or maybe even closely related species, maybe in the genus. Or sometimes you can generalize from, you know, um, you know iron deficiencies have a certain characteristic sort of a look. Sometimes you can make those, those leaps. And, and come to a, a rough conclusion. Some crops, particularly, you know, the vegetables, the broad acre crops, they have been characterized for the responses to other stresses, environmental conditions, temp high temperature, low temperature. And those things can sometimes help diagnosing for those crops. And sometimes even other diseases can be mistaken for for viruses, particularly things that are necrotic or, or you know, chlorosis type symptoms. We've already gone through that. So if you look at the literature and sort of see what are the types of things that can cause the symptoms that you're seeing, and then be careful about the symptoms. If you've got your plants curling up, your leaves curling up, and the virus makes it curl down, that can be important and make you realize, oh, maybe I have the virus or maybe I don't have the virus. Next, if all the other conditions sort of ruled out or you know not convincing, then send some photos to a diagnostic laboratory with an experienced virologist, preferably. 
I mean, the more experience they are, the more likely they're going to be able to discern. So I'm not as good as detecting, looking at pictures and going, yeah, that's virus, as, as Dennis Persley, who works with me, who's you know a distinguished virologist and been working for decades in, in Australian viruses and around the world. So send images of the new growth and send images of the whole plant. And when you send the images, check them first on your computer to make sure that they're in focus. It, it, it sounds really simple and like a no-brainer. Oh, I've taken the photo, it's in focus. But the number of times that we receive photos and they're really blurry and you can't tell what you're looking at, you'd be surprised. So then talk with them, talk with the, the diagnostic lab. You can explain some of the symptoms how long you've been seeing it, the patterns in the crop, and then you can work with them to work out what tests are going to be valuable. So for broad acre crops that are relatively well characterized, it's easier to predict which viruses are likely to be encountered given the geographic area and the time of year and the crop that you're dealing with. And in those sorts of cases, you may go, okay, it's a tomato crop, so, and it's up in North Queensland, the symptoms are good, let's test for tomato yellow leaf curl virus. And you can use some of these molecular tests to work out whether it is or it isn't. And if it's not 2YLCV, then maybe you'll test a different virus. And if it's still nothing else, then maybe you test something else and until you get an answer. What we're trying to get, what I'm trying to suggest here is that these molecular tests often require some prior knowledge as to which ones you need to complete. Because each test is a yes or a no. So if you get a test one virus, no. Test another virus, no. It can take a long time to set up these tests. And it can sometimes, it, it can be time consuming um, and frustrating to get a bunch of negatives. Particularly on nursery stock plants that are poorly characterized and may have unknown viruses present, it becomes difficult because if there's a whole slew of different viruses, some of which may or may not be, may not be present in Australia, well, do you go and get the primers for all of those different unknown viruses? Mm, if the symptoms are very convincing, then you will. You, you, you do that. But if the symptoms don't look right and the scenario just doesn't match, then what you probably will do is something that's somewhat nonspecific. You'll do an electron microscope test. It detects a wide range of virus particles, particularly it's great for large particles or abundant particles that are relatively easy to detect. But sometimes you have situations where the, the titer or the concentration of those virus particles is very low and sometimes the virus, virus particles are very small. And this is a real, it's about to pop up on the screen here, Wait for it, there we are. This is a real electron micrograph. Okay, so if you see the, the scale bar down here, that's 200 micrometers, not nanometers, sorry. So on my screen, I measured, I have two screens and the different sizes, that the whole screen is about 2.5 micrometers, which would mean that if I stacked up 400 screens side by side, it would be it would represent one millimeter. Okay. Now have a look on the screen and see if you can guess. But the stuff that you're seeing is mainly plant bits. What I call plant bits. It's cell contents because you have to crush up the cell contents. But there's the virus particle. Did anyone spot it? Raise your hand if you spotted it. Okay, so then, uh, oh, one, that's pretty good. Uh, two, okay, excellent. So I actually can't stop, I'm not, 
I'm, I don't do electron microscopy, and it takes a lot of experience. The people who do it, it takes a long time to look at these micrographs and go, ooh, that looks like a virus particle, that doesn't. What you like to see with your virus particles, another one is popping up on the screen now, is something a little bit more obvious. I promise it is coming. There it is. So these types of particles are definitely more obvious. And it's wonderful when you have something like that. So polyvirus, they have long, very long um, particles, long and thin, and they're normally very abundant. Tabamavirus the same way. So in certain cases, you can have a high confidence with simply an EM check to go, okay, we're worried about CGMMV in this cucurbit crop. There's also a number of polyviruses, and so the EM test can be quite powerful in determining, well, do I have tabamavirus particles or do I have polyvirus particles? So depending on the situation, you, it, it does take some discernment, and that's part of the reason you send um, virus suspect plants to a diagnostic lab. So if your symptoms are suspicious and you've sent them to a lab, we might go, okay, we haven't been able to detect virus particles, but let's see if we can inoculate a healthy plant. And then you, the process involved in that is get you, you crush up your, some of the sap of the symptomatic material and you use carborundum, which is basically like a, a, a mild uh, abrasive powder. And, and you push it, or you sort of rub the leaves with your inoculum. And what that does is the virus can't get through the cell walls in most cases when you just put it on the leaf. But with that abrasive substance, it can get through the cell wall. It gets part of the cell walls gone, and so it goes into the cell membrane. Sorry, I just noticed the time, and I better get moving. So if you then start to see those symptoms transmitted, to the healthy plant, then you start to become very suspicious and that's when it becomes potentially a research project to work out what virus that is because it's quite complex characterizing a new virus and can be very time consuming. But we're going to skip the, the questions at that point in the interest of time and we'll go on to this next section. We have a poll. Um, so John, would you just like to share that poll and basically you're trying to gauge how do you go for it John how do you currently yeah how do you currently manage viruses in your nursery um, no active strategies are required because you don't feel you have viruses so you use a range of cultural management practices um, infected plants are removed or you use resistant varieties or such such like so if you just like to vote um, we'll share them in a minute. Does everyone have yep. a vote? We're at 50%. So we'll go, what, five, four, three, two, one, and we're going to close. Close. And we'll and share. Yep. Oh, done, Andrew. There we go. There we go. Well, share. Yeah, so. Majority of those that voted use cultural, various cultural management practices yeah. to help with their virus control. Um, there are a few that do use resistant varieties, which is good to see. Um, but everyone seems to be doing something in order to control the viruses, Andrew, which is very good. Uh, all right. Well, uh, can you hide that one, hide that poll for me, please, yep. John? And. Uh, uh, Seems to knock me out as soon as we go through the polls. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so virus management. There's a surprising amount that you can do for viruses, and I'll go through, unfortunately, quite quickly, uh, although I think we started a couple minutes late because of our technical difficulties. So 
Removing the infected plants and the plant debris can be quite important. So certain viruses can still be active in that plant debris. So if you have it present in the nursery and you pick it up, things like TMV and other Tavama viruses, and then you touch your healthy plants, you can spread it around. Removing the weeds is important because sometimes they are hosts. You don't really care if your, vi your weed is twisted. In fact, sometimes that can be satisfying. But maybe that's caused by a virus. Other times it might be aphids and other pests. Using resistant varieties is important, particularly if you're supplying to your broadacre um, um, farmers, knowing what varieties you've got that are resistant to certain uh, viruses is important. In cases where there are no virus resistant plants and you want to ensure that you are supplying plants that are free of virus, you can do pathogen testing of your mother stock. Um, it, it can be quite important. It can mean that you have access to more clients and, and potentially can charge a premium price because they are pathogen tested mother stock free of virus or viroid X, Y, and Z. Decontaminating your tools and equipment is important. So 1% bleach for about 30 seconds is very effective for virus particles. I mean, obviously it can have an effect on the tools themselves, but the tools I feel are relatively inexpensive compared to crop loss. So some viruses, as I said, are more likely to spread by cutting. Others are more likely to spread by rubbing. So it's worthwhile knowing what you're dealing with to know, particularly when you have a, a certain virus reoccurring, become intimate with its biology and know what you're dealing with so that you can manage it in the best possible uh, way. So you can manage your insect vectors as well. So obviously monitoring is part of that. Growing under protected cropping that repels insects from landing can be important. And there's an, in there's an increasing volume of literature out there showing that UV absorbing materials and films can reduce pests moving into your crop. So that's good, not just from virus management, but also just from having fewer pests. And same with shade netting. It's not even excluding the insect per se, because there are holes in the netting, but the color and the, and the, the, the photo selective properties of the netting are such that it reduces pest pests from moving into the crop. So if you research if we research photoselective shade netting or UV absorbing cladding materials and films, you can find a fair bit of information online. Okay. Pesticides are sometimes effective, sometimes not. We've already talked about that. So if you're getting regular occurrence of a particular virus, then it's worthwhile isolating the plants, the plantings of your known hosts so that you're not moving from one of them to the next and easily transmitting that virus. So you can put in place sort of cultural barriers. So you're washing your hands when you move out of that area or, or um, using gloves in that area and then moving to the other area and using gloves in that area. Oh, you can, avoiding continuous planting helps to break that life cycle. And there are other actions that you can use to break the life cycle depending on the biology of that virus. And if all else fails, really, if you're continually having major problems, uh, sometimes you're forced to not grow that crop or grow a different one. As I said before, tobacco mosaic virus, I call that the big bad wolf of the virus world. It has a wide host range. It causes a wide variety of symptoms. And this petunia was infected with tobacco mosaic virus. So sometimes you get basically no symptoms. The, the virus particles are very stable. So if you go and touch a virus, a TVMV infected plant, and then you go and touch the handle on your tunnel, and the next person comes along, opens that door, closes that door, they have particles on their hands and can potentially infect that next plant. Same way with rubbing on the clothes. So there's been cases where you know you walk through a crop and then you can walk through another crop that's healthy healthy and you can infect that crop with TMV. Okay. So when you're dealing 
with those virus-like symptoms and you don't know what to do next, it's important to keep an open mind. I know that sounds really simple, but the, the more you say, no, it can't be this and it can't be this, if, if you don't have real information behind, backing that up, you might actually be overlooking an area which could be the cause of the symptoms. So check your growing median water pH and EC. Most growers have them and I would like to suggest that if you don't, then it's worthwhile to get them and use them regularly. Correlate your climatic conditions. Investigate the nutritional regime. It costs money to work out what nutrients are in those leaves, but it can be worthwhile to work out, okay, do I have, is the nutritional regime in the symptomatic plants different from that in the healthy? And investigate the phytotoxicity. And that could even involve going, okay, well, I've sprayed with these products uh, right before the symptoms started to occur. So I'll spray these six healthy ones with, the, with this product and these ones with that product and this, these ones with the combination of those products and see if it actually has an effect. Make sure you have a control, an untreated control as, as a benchmark for comparison. Okay, the last thing we're going to do is skip over some resources and some of these things are uh, we've talked about many, many times. There are fact sheets in the NGIA website. We have a fact sheet specifically on virus management in the nursery. So the easiest thing to do is to click on, go to the NGIA, NGIA website and click and search for fact sheets. There are these other um, tools available to you. In the interest of time, and that we're 10 minutes over, I'm going to just skip to the end and um, say so thank you for attending. Um, at the beginning of the webinar we did have those technical difficulties. Most of this information or a lot of the information came from John Thomas who is a, a, a world-renowned plant virologist and so he is an author on this um, webinar out of courtesy uh, and to acknowledge that he had a great input into that. The webinar is going to be made available on the on the YouTube channel shortly and I'll send out a survey, an email uh, with the link where that YouTube, where the video will be found so you can look at it at a later date if you would like to. And if you have any questions you want to email us, you'll have my email from the from what, that survey that I emailed that I'll send out but you can also contact GrowHelp um, if you'd like to. Okay. We just have one question I think we should answer, Andrew, at the moment. Uh -huh. um, with, regard, with regards to um, sterilising your cutting equipment, how mm -hmm. effective is milk? Okay, so and milk powder milk, milk powder is very effective for Tabamo viruses only. So for some reason, the protein in milk binds to Bamo virus particles, particularly TMV. And I think other Tabamo viruses have been tested. I don't know why it binds the, the particles, but it does. Um, and DAS, so Dennis Pursley, he put together a fact sheet specifically on Tabamo virus management, and it does describe how you do that with, with milk. So yes, it is an option, but only for Tabamo virus. And that's why I've suggested using bleach, because it's a, it's a broad spectrum. So what about ethanol? Because I know other, some people would probably use ethanol and maybe even flame their tools afterwards so they actually get um, burning as well as uh, ethanol is um, mm -hmm. controlling it. So Look, the burning might have an effect, but my understanding is that ethanol doesn't do anything to virus particles. Okay. And can you give the name of that paper? What I'll do is I'll send that him the link. I'll send that in as a link in the email that I send with the survey shortly, okay? Yep, excellent. Okay, that's All right. it. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, as Andrew said, this uh, webinar will be placed on the U Nursery YouTube website very shortly. So if you want to hear it again, you're more than welcome. And if others 
that you do know weren't able to attend, they can actually look at it as well. And we do have one last question from Dan again. How would bleach actually yep. kill the virus? So bleach is an oxidizing agent, is my understanding. So it has it breaks down organic material. That's my understanding. There probably is a technical reason that I'm not aware of, but it, it breaks down organic material and viruses are still organic material. Yep. Okay. So hopefully that answers your question, Dan. So thanks once again everyone. Um until next time. Cheerio. Okay, thank you. Bye bye.